Carol, I have followed the search for extraterrestrial life for decades from various, uh, various aspects, including SETI. Um, question is, what can a philosopher of biology bring to this uh, exploration? So that's a really good question. I'm often asked, uh, a lot of people think that philosophy of biology is kind of an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. The issue is that when you're a biologist, you're looking for uh, certain kinds of features that your training has taught you are relevant to life. When you're a philosopher, you're looking from the outside in. That is to say, you're looking at those assumptions that have driven your expectations about life, and you're looking at the methodology you use. So a philosopher of biology has a kind of outsider's, an informed outsider's perspective on uh, you know, biology that somebody who is a biologist lacks because they're too immersed in the mm. field. Mm. Why is it the case that when everybody tries to explain the Fermi paradox, where are they because the universe is so vast, it should be teeming with life that, that, that's obvious, that every explanation sounds on its surface correct. Uh, for example, uh, that uh, civilizations uh, kill themselves off after a time or some of them become more interested in virtual reality and don't want to bother with the external reality. It all makes sense, but you'd have to assume every single civilization in this vast universe has done that because we see no evidence. Well, one of the reasons that we might see no evidence is not that they don't exist, but that they destroyed each other uh, very early on. Uh, that is to say, Look at us here on Earth. I mean, we have the climate crisis, we have nuclear weapons. Uh, we are actually on the razor's edge of destroying our own uh, culture and our own technological capacities and basically returning to a, shall we say, earlier stage of development. Uh, I don't hold out a lot of hope for the future because of the short-term interest that human beings have. I think if you think that Darwinian evolution uh, is characteristic of life everywhere. I don't think that's obvious, but supposing that it is, Darwinian evolution is a very short-term type of process. That is to say, uh, you and your offspring are all that matters for survival from a Darwinian perspective. And you see that in American uh, and uh, actually worldwide perspectives on things. People don't want to cut back on uh, their uh, you know, they're carbon, uh, you know, they're emitting carbon, they don't want to, you know, be inconvenienced. And so you could argue that most civilizations go through a bottleneck like we're going, and they don't come out the other end. They don't continue to become spacefaring uh, uh, you know, civilizations. There's also the problem of physics. If current physics is correct, then uh, we can't really travel to distant stars except by many generations of spaceship travel. And most, uh, shall we say, people would be unwilling to get on a spaceship, and most spaceships probably wouldn't survive such travel. So there's also the vast distances. Uh, yes, there are signals that you can send, presumably, but we don't know that our advanced aliens are using the same signals that we're using. I mean, radio uh, signals, maybe they aren't using. Maybe they're using a completely different technology that we don't understand yet. Yet there's another answer to the Fermi paradox. They're here but they don't want us to know that. <laughs> so there are numerous, I think, answers to that question. I tend to um, actually think that the one that they tend to destroy themselves is the most likely. That doesn't mean that there aren't technological civilizations out there, but it means there are probably much, many fewer and far between than the number of uh, early technological civilizations that go under due to their own short-term interests.